we'll just start. So um, again, welcome everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining the first uh, joint URIZI and Dot Space webinar on uh, space opportunities for climate challenges. Uh, this is a monthly, the, the first in a monthly series of webinars where we uh, talk about the opportunities of space for, uh, for climate. Um, and today we're going to talk about uh, space for biodiversity. So thank you very much for joining this uh, particular topic. As I said before, this is the first in a monthly series of webinars. The next one will be in January. We'll talk about that later. Uh, that are all about the combination of space and climate, the opportunities for space and climate challenges, we've called it. Um, we do this together with Yuri Z, who will uh, introduce themselves, and Brandstation.space, who will also introduce themselves in a little bit. Um, the agenda for uh, the next hour, or well, if we move over a little bit, we have some more time if needed, we'll try to stick within the hour. We'll um, welcome you, that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, we'll introduce the topic, we'll share a little bit of news that's relevant to the topic, uh, some events that are relevant to the topic. Then we have speakers that we selected for you who can uh, talk about the topic. And um, then we will allow um, one minute pitches, anyone really, who has uh, something to say about the uh, the topic, we've asked them in the um, on the registration form uh, to indicate if they're interested in doing a one minute pitch to this audience, um, and we'll have at least one of those today. And after that, as I said before, and I'll keep repeating this, we will move over to the Open Campus Forum where we can continue the discussion 24 seven online in the uh, GrantStation.space um, Open Campus Forum. So um, with that, I would like to uh, give the floor to Cornel to uh, talk a little bit more about URC. Perfect. Uh, so thank you for introducing us to this exciting new platform. Um, so first of all, my name is, is Cornel Bogaert. Uh, I'm a Belgian national trainee for the European Space Agency, and I work for uh, URISI. And my colleague, uh, Annalisa Donati, she will explain a bit more about our organization in a few minutes. Uh, but first, I want to say uh, a bit or elaborate a bit on the topic of today, which is biodiversity and uh, plant health. So um, anyone who did not yet see this, uh, this documentary, um, it's, it's very relevant and it's available on Netflix. Um, I cannot recommend this enough, um, a life on our planet. And I just um, took some uh, numbers from, from this documentary. Uh, it starts in the early life of, of David Attenborough um, and you can really see the, the numbers change over the years. So from late 30s to the 60s, you can see a slight drop of uh, the remaining wilderness worldwide, um, but the real dramatic uh, loss of biodiversity is really noticeable. Uh, by the end of uh, the, the, the 70s, where you can see it drops to 55%. And uh, by the uh, end of the 90s, it's uh, even as low as uh, 46%. And the air pollution is also, um, well, very much on the rise. And um, you can already guess what my next slide will be. It's about this year. It's the numbers of 2020. And, um, well, it's not good. Uh, so we have never been with so many people on, on this planet and uh, air pollution has never been so high um, while at the same time our biodiversity is uh, so, I mean, it's, it's so low, it's, it's um, in less than 100 years it has uh, halved, so it's now up, it's as low as 35%. And um, so I, I, do, I do not want only to deliver this doom scenario or this negative message because in this documentary, there was also a very positive message. Um, there was uh, mention of, of this, uh, the Apollo mission, which was launched by the end of the 60s. And, and with it, this mission, we had the first picture of our planet seen from space. Uh, so we had a blue sphere in the blackness of, of space. And in that one shot, there was the whole of humanity with nothing else uh, except the person that was in the spacecraft taking the picture. And uh, this image completely changed uh, the, the mindset of the human population uh, on the world. And this is also something we hear these days uh, when astronauts return from their journey on the ISS. They always talk about uh, our delicate um, atmosphere protecting uh, our planet. And this is something we should uh, aim to protect. And that's also something we are going to talk about today because um, of course, uh, space it's more than just uh, there to offer us nice images uh, it's also about the the uh, numerous uh, satellites orbiting our planet and monitoring the the ecosystems that are so important uh, for us to adapt to climate change and um, 
we see that by diversity it's being lost, uh, ecosystems are collapsing at an alarming rate, um, and it is clear that our window of opportunity is closing very rapidly, and um, it has never been more urgent uh, to restore these, these damaged ecosystems uh, than right now. And our Space for Climate initiative, um, we really uh, intend to rally uh, all relevant stakeholders to invest in biodiversity and uh, in new approaches to speed up uh, the actions uh, within the framework of the UN Decade for Restoration, as well as within the Green Deal Biodiversity Strategy for 2030. Um, now 2030, it's also the deadline for the Sustainable Development Goals. And it is also the timeline that scientists have identified as the last chance to prevent uh, catastrophic climate change. So really from increased social awareness to more engagement with private sector and policy support landscapes, uh, there is a distinct need to build um, this multi, these multidisciplinary uh, collaborations. And while solutions for the restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems are available right now, they are often not integrated enough in today's governance. Uh, despite the Copernicus free open data policy, um, the uptake of satellite remote sensing is, is still limited. And so today we would like to discuss the uh, space opportunities within uh, European calls, uh, even European calls that are not specifically uh, targeting uh, space, uh, such as, for example, the Green Deal. And um, so we have, that's why we brought such a, a broad range of, of speakers today. Um, but before we get, uh, before we get to our speakers, I would like um, to introduce uh, the audience to uh, Annalisa Donati, and she will explain uh, more about UEZ as, uh, as uh, the organization. So Annalisa, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you very much, Cornil. Thank you very much, Renko, and uh, all the organizers for like uh, presenting the platform, presenting the um, concept, as well as the topic of today. Uh, I will present very briefly what UEZ is and what we're doing and our, um, basically, our core activities. Great. So, uh, Basically, uh, UEZ is a non-for-profit association, it's based in uh, Paris, as it was founded by the then French minister uh, Hubert Curien back in 1989. And uh, we gathered together uh, several among uh, national space agencies across Europe and uh, the European Space Agency, which is one of our founding members and our, uh, let's say, biggest contributor, and some of uh, the um, uh, most innovative research institutes uh, across, uh, across Europe. Um, this unique membership structure is basically allowing those uh, institutions to work together to share principles and to share long-term visions um, and uh, to give us the chance to basically be uh, absolutely uh, independent and autonomous in uh, working with professional communities of non-space uh, stakeholders. The mission which was uh, given to the to Eurizi is uh, to bridge the gap between space and society. And uh, it was definitely relevant back in 1989 when the when the organization was established and it's still relevant today uh, because uh, as uh, Cornel mentioned earlier and uh, as uh, it is clear, um, sometimes it's uh, uh, space and uh, space applications and technologies are perceived as uh, difficult and hard to, to integrate in the daily workflow, but they can actually provide a lot of benefits. So, what we are doing to basically fulfill this mission is uh, to actually um, stimulate the dialogue and uh, um, exchange uh, good practices and experiences between the early adopters of uh, satellite-based solution and uh, the um, community that uh, could benefit from those solutions themselves. So. Um, Indeed, we do this uh, in uh, different ways. Uh, we, for instance, raise awareness on the benefits of satellite-based solutions. We do um, champion the needs of the end users. So we collect success stories and we, I'm here today also to um, invite all of the um, end users and uh, the companies, SMEs, the startups that are providing satellite solutions and that's, uh, that are already offering on the market 
some uh, some solutions uh, to contact us and we will support uh, uh, the um, uh, communication and um, the awareness on the on the existing services out there and uh, we do connect in this sense uh, professional communities uh, and uh, and uh, space based organization and we bring back the um, um, let's say the, the, the outcomes of uh, of this work in terms of uh, policy recommendation to the policy makers and uh, to um, administration at any level from from local level at uh, until the european level itself and uh, how we do so we basically act as a facilitator as uh, as i said so um, we really are keen to understand uh, what is already available uh, out there and um, and how this uh, can basically uh, be uh, brought to the to the end users we are a matchmaker so we su we support on one side the um, smes and the service providers and on the other side Again, we we try to understand the pattern of integration of those solutions into daily workflow of the end user in uh, a lot of different domains, uh, uh, which uh, are right now from, uh, uh, let's say, smart cities to the domain of maritime to uh, um, agriculture, as well as uh, sports and uh, many, many other sectors. And uh, we do advise. so. In all this process, we gather uh, feedback and uh, we bring it back to policy policymaker. We realize that there is a certain uh, bottlenecks again in the integration uptake of uh, those services, and uh, we want to make our institution that are um, there to create better policies aware of uh, the obstacles and the setbacks. So I uh, invite all of you to follow us on our social media and uh, to visit our website where you can find much, much more about uh, our activities. And uh, of course, do not hesitate to contact us and uh, to share with us your experiences. Thank you very much, Annalisa. I would also like to really briefly, but really briefly, introduce Ground Station with Space, the other partner in this. Um, and I will share these slides, so I'm not going to read this out to you, but uh, uh, GroundStation.Space and the Dot Space Foundation uh, are a very proud member of EuroZ and co-organizer of this event. And uh, we basically bring together government education and companies around the topic of space technology and space data. Um, so check our website, GroundStation.Space, uh, to learn more about that. Um, I would also like to really briefly give you a little bit of relevant news um, that has been uh, published recently uh, on biodiversity. So first of all, very important, last 30 September, we saw the United Nations Summit on Biodiversity, and I will share these slides. You can, you can uh, follow these links with a, an enormous amount of information from the United Nations on biodiversity. Um, this year is the International Year of Plant Health. Cornel already introduced that. Um, I didn't know that until a few weeks uh, ago uh, when we started to prepare for this, but uh, this again brings with it lots of initiatives uh, from a United Nations uh, level on, uh, on um, uh, biodiversity and plant health specifically. Um, the, the European Union has um, announced uh, in a new decade of biodiversity strategy um, moving from the 2010-2020 to the 2020-2030 um, strategy. And again, there's a lot of information available and a lot of opportunities are available um, derived from this biodiversity strategy, uh, including the European Green Deal. Um, and uh, there's a lot of money available. And we'll talk about that a little bit later because we're all about uh, showing you these opportunities for space and uh, space-related industries. Uh, the European Green Deal itself, um, there's um, um, GroundStation.Space organized a webinar um, uh, about a month ago, just over a month, uh, what am I saying, uh, two months ago, um, where we had lots of information and through our website, through this link, again, that we'll share with you, you can download some of that information. Um, then events, uh, there's really one big event that we should all be looking forward to next week, which is European Space Week. It's the whole week where uh, um, uh, the European Space Policy will present itself. 
uh, in all its different aspects. But one thing that I'd like to highlight is on ten, the, uh, the 10th of December next week, uh, there's a session on the EU space program and the European Green Deal. Anyone can register for this for free. And it's a great opportunity to uh, get acquainted to everything related to, uh, to European space policy, the European space programs, uh, and the opportunities related to the European space program. Um, so now, Cornel, sorry for the intermezzo, but now I would like to hand it back to you to introduce uh, our speakers of the day. Thank you, Remco. Um, so let's uh, let's go over to our first speaker. Um, so uh, Jana Milerova, she holds a PhD at the University of Life Sciences, Life Sciences uh, from the from, from the Institute of Applied Ecology in uh, Prague, where she worked on a remote sensing approach to the study of subalpine uh, vegetation. Uh, she is uh, deputy uh, head of the Department of GIS and Remote Sensing at the Institute of Botany uh, of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Uh, and she was involved in a large number of research projects and publications uh, ranging from uh, maintaining biodiversity in African savanna to the vegetation of the Arctic tundra system. And uh, today she will explain how satellite imagery contributes to her research, uh, such as to manage alien uh, invasive species. Uh, so, Jana, uh, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, so today I'll I'll be talking about the about the, our work and the, on the plant invasion monitoring because I work with the plants with vegetation and uh, using um, combining different sources of uh, remote sensing, actually satellite imagery, uh, aerial imagery, and unmanned aircraft. And uh, in our work, uh, overall topic is uh, timing and scale. That really matters if you want to address any of the uh, feature with on vegetation and uh, for the plant invasion especially. Uh, so uh, why plant invasions? I think every uh, this audience is aware of the problem of invasion threat of the bio biodiversity, ecosystem functioning and landscapes. Uh, and uh, because the impact grows and because the, the uh, elimination of the, of the invasions is very difficult once they are fully established, uh, we need uh, fast and precise monitoring. This is a very crucial tool. And remote sensing here comes in place. So to improve early detection and to provide fast, repeatable and efficient methods that allow the timely monitoring and of course as well reduce the cost of fuel campaigns that are really uh, expensive and they might be um, not efficient enough in some cases of course there are limits of remote sensing that i would like to talk about as well compared to the field campaigns and of course uh, one of the advantages also is that it can provide uh, spatial information on the structure and temporal aspect of uh, the development of invasions that we need to tackle in them properly. So there are many data available uh, from the remote sensing, uh, satellites, aerial data, and as I said, uh, drones. They have a different uh, spatial, spectral, and time uh, temporal resolution. So for the uh, satellite imagery, there is a long time series. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are very costly if they are very high resolution satellites. Aerial imagery provides a long time series. Uh, of course, the, uh, may, the offer of the time the windows might be limited for the aerial imagery. We only have uh, what is available. For the UIV or UIS or drones or whatever, however you call it, it is very flexible tool. You, I, you can actually uh, put any sensor in it, not only RGB, but also uh, if you wish, and if you have enough money for the instruments. And uh, they can provide optimal timing of the campaign and targeted monitoring. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there is a lot of problems. They are not standardized. The, the processing is quite complex. There is a lot of constraints. And of course, this is not a tool for large scale monitor for um, like a landscape or regional or country monitoring. It's, it's only for the targeted. So each of the of the tools provides is um, some uh, is is useful for some of the purposes and is, is less useful for the others. 
uh, remote sensing together with the field survey uh, provides information about where the species is and it will allow us to assess the invasion dynamics and impact and to model the structure or the future spread and uh, specify the habitats that are especially prone to invasion for the targeted monitoring and also the tools can help us to uh, survey after to check after eradication campaign how successful the campaign was and if there are not any any uh, sources of this uh, of seeds left in the landscape um, so uh, the optimal methodology is crucial so how to define there are three aspects, as I said, spatial, temporal, and, uh, and uh, spectral resolution. So the, the first come to the rule of spatial resolution. Here you can see an example from giant hawkweed, Heraclum antigazianum. You might know the plant. It's very huge, as you can see on the first photo. So it's quite good for the remote sensing because it's so big. And the white uh, compound umbels are very easy to see from the imagery, even on aerial band chromatic imagery from, from uh, historical times. This is from 1962. You can still see. And uh, when you go to the um, uh, coarser rapid eye imagery or Pleiades uh, imagery uh, for satellites, you can still see quite well. Uh, uh, and on the UIV or UIS data, you can even see individual candles that umbels that you might not actually want to see. That sometimes it, it provides too much detail. When we go to coarse resolution, with rapid eye or sentinel, it would be more about spectra than about the object definition because it's too coarse. There is also important uh, rule of temporal resolution. For many of the plants, it's, they are quite easy to detect in a certain period of phenological cycle, and they are very difficult to detect in other parts. This is on the upper row, there is an example again from giant hawkweed, where you can see when the, when the umbels are flowering, it's very easy to see because they are white. Uh, when they are a little bit later out of flowering, it gets more difficult to distinguish and out of uh, flowering, it's very difficult. And uh, low row is an example from Asian or exotic knockweeds, the Rainutria uh, taxa, uh, that are very problematic all over the Europe. And in here, during the summer, it's not very easy to distinguish them from the other uh, vegetation, but in late autumn, when they uh, uh, turn when they drop the leaves, but uh, the stems turn very reddish color. It's quite easy to distinguish even on the on the quite coarse imagery. So right timing can be crucial as well. And this is where where UIS or drones comes in place, where we can they allow us to study the phenological effects on the on the data on the on the detection, and to choose the right timing that we can then apply on the satellite imagery. This is an example of Ailantus altissima tree of heaven, where also in the spring, it's quite easy to detect in the summer, it's much more difficult. Of course, a, a classification approach is also important, uh, whether to choose uh, the higher spatial resolution and or higher spectral resolution data, depending on the, on the character of the species, how significant it is compared to other surrounding vegetation if it has uh, formed significant objects or uh, significant spectral signatures or if the species is we need some more detailed more hy hybrid approaches and we also need some maybe some supporting information from other sources so this is just a simple uh, decision tree of how to define what kind of data we will need and what kind of algorithms we need depending on the species how similar or uh, not similar it is to the surroundings and what are the specific features of the, of the plant. And, and then depending on what, what kind of resolution algorithms we are doing. 
Um, this is uh, just uh, to show the UIV campaign, AYS campaign, and drone campaign. <laughs> From planning the mission to through the field campaign, pre-processing the data and documentation, resulting maps, geodata bases. So just a short overview. And uh, this is an example of classification. This is from uh, aerial imagery, actually, where we can, uh, with the object-based image analysis, we can get quite nice results uh, with detail mapping of individual uh, hogwood. And this is, for example, for the giant hogwood. Uh, if we compare remote sensing and field survey, and this is an example from giant hogwood. Uh, we were interested in how sufficient, how effective, effective it is, efficient, sorry, it is uh, compared to the field surveys. And we found out that uh, like 74% of the plants were detected in with both uh, remote sensing and field survey. And 19% uh, were not detected by the, by the remote sensing. So we, which is quite a lot, then when we broke it down to the uh, to see what what is why why how it what, why it was uh, this uh, why these species were uh, plants were not detected then we found out that most of uh, quite a large part of the not detected plants is was mown or grazed and it means that uh, with the remote sensing we could not see the plants because they were very creepy, very small and not flowering. With the field survey, you can still, of course, see, but not with the remote sensing. So this is one of the limits where, when the plant is not in a normal shape, when it's, I don't know, sprayed or eaten or not very uh, growing normally, you, you are probably going to miss it by the remote sensing compared to the field survey. But on the other hand, with the field survey, uh, usually surveyors tend to, to, to go around uh, roads or trails and to uh, omit the less success, success, sorry, <laughs> less accessible areas. So you can, uh, there are some, some uh, limits of the, of the field survey always. And if we consider the financing or the economical side of the field survey compared to remote sensing, we definitely get to the um, in favor of remote sensing. Of course, it depends on the species. If the species is very difficult to detect, then the success rate is much smaller. And then we have to consider adding an extra work. We also compared automatic versus manual interpretation. Uh, manual interpretation seems to be more precise and the first sight. But uh, when we uh, when we compare it, uh, we saw that uh, the manual interpretation is much less complex. There is a low number of polygons, and especially in later stages of invasion, when the larger areas are invaded, uh, manual interpreter tends to just uh, make a large polygon of all the area that is that is infested in, uh, uh, compared to the um, automatic approach that only limit really delineates the individual plants or individual stands. Uh, so when we compare, uh, when we come back to the satellite imagery and to look at the, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, drones versus satellite imagery, uh, we can say that if we compare to the NASA and ESA satellites, means like Landsat and Sentinel-2 in our case, uh, the spatial resolution of the satellites is much lower than for the for the drones. Uh, the flexibility in timing, of course, it's it's much better for the drones as well, as well as the frequency that we are able to frequently fly, like every week, every day, if we wish. Uh, but the costs, of course, are much lower because these satellites are free uh, compared to the drones. And uh, for the drones, there is a lot of acquisition constraints. For example, the drones cannot fly over the build-up areas. There are limits around the, around the uh, airports. And uh, it's quite complicated uh, approach to, to sample the data, to, 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 uh, to get the data, and also the pre-process the data. And there is no archival data available. We cannot go back to the history. Uh, 
if we compare to the high resolution satellite, very high resolution satellites, these are commercial, I mean, then we can uh, get a higher spatial, uh, uh, still UIS provides higher spatial resolution, but it's not, the, the difference is not as great. And of course, the flexibility of, uh, of the drones is higher. Uh, these satellites are usually not, not operational, they only fly on purpose, so the, the archive, archive is not as, as uh, uh, rich. And uh, the cost of data acquisition is much cheaper by drones using uh, comparing to uh, high resolution satellites. But of course, again, uh, there are acquisition constraints of the drones and content processing. And for aerial data, it's uh, quite a, quite a similar. To, um, there is a lot of problems, as I said, with the UIS. Amount of data is huge. Uh, there are differences in, in images and, and there are a lot of pre-processing, there are leaky constraints and there are many artifacts and uh, we need GCPs or uh, good, uh, good georeferencing system on, on board. Um, uh, so uh, so to, to conclude uh, this part, I uh, would say that there is a lot of uh, advantages of this very high resolution data, but uh, we have to make, uh, have in mind that satellite imagery is uh, very uh, powerful in tackling the landscape scale and the regional scale and in getting like uh, operational uh, monitoring that would be repeatable in, in, uh, on a larger, larger scales. This is an example of uh, invasion at the landscape scale that was done using uh, uh, remote sensing data, using rapid eye data, actually. And here you can see with an, an historical imagery, uh, aerial imagery, and you can see the, the development of invasion. I can maybe put it again. This is the, from 1962, 1973, uh, 1991, and 1996. This is an invasion of giant hawkweed. On the, uh, in the western part of the Czech Republic. It's actually the region that is most infected uh, by invasion. And uh, this is a, just a comparison of invaded area and the rate of aerial and lunar spread that is comparable to uh, the most dangerous, uh, most uh, dangerous invaders, plant invaders in around the world. And the process of invasion uh, the procedure. And here is an example of the detailed spread in the landscape derived again from the combination of uh, aerial, historical aerial imagery and the satellite imagery for the last decades. And this approach allowed us to assess the rule of connectivity, rule of corridors, uh, habitat suitable habitat availability and other um, dimensions of the invasion di invasion process so we can we are able to sort of trace the course of invasion from the beginning and we can uh, assess the different uh, drivers or parameters that influence the course of invasion such as the rate of spread and frequency of disturbances land use and land abandonment, fragmentation, corridor density, and etc. So the, for the practical implication, I'd say that remote sensing has both advantages and limits. There is a methodology definitely must re reflects the phenology, morphology, and structure of the plant. It can ha help to identify areas of the highest risk. And uh, there's definitely the choice of data is crucial where uh, uh, satellite imagery can serve as an overview and very high resolution data can help us to make the, the early detection. And there is different uh, accuracy, uh, acceptable ac accuracy levels, uh, maximal for locate infestation hotspots and lower for to cover all infested localities. And there is of course a trade-off between species and data. You have a giant like giant hawkweed, then you don't need very high resolution data. 
to have more problematic species, then you need to have use uh, a more rich data. And uh, now we are dealing with the assessing efficiency of the irrigation campaign and operational use of annual sand in the nature conservation. This would mainly be done with the satellite imagery. And of course, also the rule of uh, landscape history and socioeconomic socio impact. We also try to engage public in, through citizen science and rising awareness because we think it's very important. And uh, I would also like to draw your attention to the IPBS assessment of invasive urban species that I am part of. And uh, now uh, this summer we came with the first order draft and now the, the next autumn we, there will be second order draft. Uh, second version of the of the draft of the assessment where everybody could uh, can uh, comment on and we will appreciate the public um, feedback on the on the preparation of assessment and so this with us i would like to thank you for your attention okay thank you very much ayana for your um, presentation so let's uh, go straight to our next uh, speaker um, so our next speaker is uh, Baldessera Giovanni. He has a PhD in uh, biochemistry and molecular biophysics and worked for a number of years as a researcher in world-leading universities, uh, governmental agencies and private companies. He is the coordinator of uh, UPRESCO, a network for phytosanitary uh, research coordination and funding at the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization and he is involved in international research cooperation and transnational public partnerships um, supporting national and international policy. So he will speak uh, about plant health surveillance and opportunities on how satellite remote sensing can support activities uh, in the field. So Balesera, please, uh, you have the floor. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cornell, and thank you to the organizers to give me the opportunity to present uh, the main message of the policy brief that we published this year, um, UFRISCO and URIC on satellite data to strengthen plant health. And I also want to say that I'm very honored to um, kick off the series of webinars uh, with an important topic, which is uh, plant health. Um, so, um, then I cannot change the. Uh, okay. Um, so, just a few words on uh, um, Ufresco. Um, Ufresco is a network for phytosanitary research coordination and uh, funding. The network is composed of research funders, policymakers, and regulators and scientists interested to collaborate on plant health research activities. The network has successfully uh, built an ecosystem where organizations with different mandates can collaborate and feed each other with inputs. As of 2020, the network is composed of organizations for, from more than 50 countries worldwide. If I had talked about uh, quarantine last year, probably nobody would have known the meaning of this word. The recent COVID-19 pandemic has raised the profile of human quarantine. What maybe you do not know is that quarantine also applies to animal health and to plant health. The question is then, uh, why a regulation for plants? because plants and plant products move through uh, trade. Some examples of plants and plant products are the commodity that we use for foods, uh, but also as ornamentals or simply to ship uh, things. And by moving plants and plant products, there is the risk to move their inhabitants, which are those bacteria, viruses, insects, and other pests that can cause serious damages if they enter into a new area where they do not have natural enemies and they can uh, establish. Plant health problems have been exacerbated in recent years by globalization and the movement of people by trade, whose volume has increased 20-fold in the last decades, 
and by climate change that can increase the natural dispersal of pests and facilitate their establishment in new areas. As an example, the rate of first records for insect has grown exponentially since uh, 1950. Some examples of uh, plant pests and their impact are um, Salella fastidiosa. Uh, from the American continent, the bacterium has moved into Europe, where it was officially reported in 2013. 600 plant species are known to be host, many of which economically important. In southern Italy, the bacterium is killing millions of olive trees. Agrilus planipennis. From Asia, the insect moved into America and is now at the door of Europe. The major host is ash and trees can be killed in just a few years, causing damages to forests and urban environment. Spodoptera frugiperda. From South America, the pest moved into Africa, where it was first officially reported in 2016. In just four years, fall armyworm has expanded through Africa, South Asia, and Australia. The pest main host is maize, a staple food. But plant pests are not only a threat to agriculture and food security, they are also a threat to trade, the environment, human health, and our culture and living. Countries are protected by an army of inspectors, diagnosticians, risk managers, and researchers that work on preventing the entry or the establishment of pests. Just to give you an idea of the amount of work uh, that these people have to deal with, uh, more than 300 pests are regulated into the EU territory, but resources are very limited if we consider that these activities take place pre-border, at border, and inland. Remote sensing technology uh, have the potential to guide and instruct on ground surveillance activities and other phytosanitary measures of the National Plant Protection Organizations. Remote sensing can help because it allows to easily monitor large areas or areas that are difficult to reach, to identify and map plants and trees, and to detect stress in plants before it is visible to the naked eye. Um, an example is uh, uh, the work on uh, Citrus tristeza mo virus monitoring in uh, Apulia. Um, but in order to accelerate the use of remote sensing technologies in plant health surveillance programs, some gaps need to be addressed. The first one is data limitations. Resolution of freely available data is too low to monitor plant pests. It's then necessary to establish mechanisms to facilitate access to high resolution data. Also, pest specific sensors are missing. It is then necessary to identify areas of the electromagnetic spectrum to detect specific biotic stresses and to progress on research on sensor technology and to develop sensors that are user friendly. Another gap is represented by the resources and the capacity. National plant protection organizations have limited resources and no expertise to integrate satellite based data into their routine activities. Communication and collaboration between remote sensing and plant health experts should be enhanced to ensure transfer of knowledge and expertise. So all these recommendations and orders um, are available from the report of Dufresco project, the application of remote sensing in plant health that is freely available on Zenoto. So I'm inviting you to, to read this nice report. And before I conclude, I would like to invite you to check the Eufresco CM video contest Plant Health TV, research that helps plant health. The idea is to prepare short video, up to three minutes, on any research activity involving plant health. Uh, so if you have a nice story uh, to tell, do not hesitate to participate in the contest. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Baldessara, for your presentation. Um, so next we have Cecile Renault. Um, she gained a broad education combining biology and agro uh, activities. She then graduated from the International Space University and worked as a research analyst for the French space agency CNES. She now works uh, on strategic positioning, products and business development focused on agriculture and environment for the Belgian startup uh, Aerospace Lab. And she will present the environmental intelligence that the company aims to provide to the relevant stakeholders. So, Cecile, um, the floor is yours. You can present. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So, as Corinne just said, uh, my name is Cecile Renault. I'm a business developer at Aerospace Lab. Aerospace Lab is a Belgian startup based close by Brussels. We are working um, on actionable geospatial intelligence. Our goal is to access all markets in order to provide geospatial intelligence efficiently. By using satellite data and our own artificial intelligence, we unlock solutions for a lot of segments such as environment. I don't have time to go through all our projects for this segment, but I will present our most major application right now. It is still in development, but as far as the stage of proof of concept, which is uh, very great. Um, so this application is about a major subject concerning environmental project protection, um, the oil spill detection. So as you may know, oil spill isn't only about accidents. A lot of boats are illegally discharging petrol into the ocean, mostly international water. And consequences for our environment are major, and we must stop these actions. By using satell satellites, we can detect oil spill from space. This source of information allows us to monitor a very wide area and detect oil on the sea surface. It also allows detection of strong radar reflectors, such as vessels and offshore installation. Last but not least, uh, by using radar detection, we can monitor the sea surface during day and night. Based on this, Aerospace Lab is currently developing a solution using Copernicus Sentinel-1 data to monitor oil spill close by coasts. Our artificial intelligence is able to determine if an oil spill is illegal or not by recognizing its specific shape. Later on, we will be able to detect oil spill all around the world with our own satellite constellation starting to be launched next year. In order to better understand our development process, here is the methodology used. So we get images from satellites. After a first pre-processing, we use these images to constitute a data set in order to train our neural networks. The training is done with pre-processed images of oil spills and look-alikes. By labeling images accordingly to their content, oil spill or not, our algorithms uh, learn to recognize oil spills <coughs> on images from a data set. And after that, it is able to detect oil spill on new satellites, on new satellites images. <coughs> so of course, we must improve the algorithms to make them even more reliable, especially regarding false positives. There is uh, different lookalikes, such as biogenic films, waves, low wind speed, that can deceive our artificial intelligence. And by a machine learning processing, our AI is still learning to recognize oil spill from lookalikes. And obviously we have to minimize false positive in, uh, to be as precise as possible. After pre-processing, our team is able to determine the likely source of a slick, its length, and a precise geographical uh, position. In the future, we aim to be able to accurately detect slicks and be able to cross-check with maritime data, such as radio frequencies, in order to determine the identity of a ship at uh, the origin of illegal discharge. Concerning oil spill from accidental events, the detection allows actions in order to minimize the impact and stop the propagation as soon as possible. By averting authorities, we will allow a fast action with an um, exact position and accurate information corresponding to the expansion. So um, in general, oil spill can affect animals and plants 
from oil itself and also from cleanup operations. The impact of spilled oil is obviously related to its very poisonous chemical constituents. This can affect organisms both from internal exposure to oil through ingestion or inhalation and from external exposure through skin and eye irritation. Regarding plants and algae, the oil prevents photosynthesis and leads to the death of the organism. Of course, oil spill detection is only one of our projects regarding environment and biodiversity protection. We want to expand our activities to other major subjects such as deforestation, wild uh, fire and marine pollution and others. It is only the beginning of our activities at Aerospace Lab and we hope to share a better future from space. Thank you for your attention and I will be pleased to answer your question if any. Okay, thank you very much, Cecile. I would suggest we uh, move to the last two speakers and then perhaps take a little bit of time for Q&A because I do want to give people the, uh, the opportunity, the last speakers, to, um, uh, an opportunity to uh, give their presentation as well. We are uh, running a little bit late, as I said, um, but no problem, we won't hang up at five o'clock sharp. We'll just extend the webinar um, at, as long as needed. So I hope you, uh, you're able to stay on. Um, I do understand if you uh, if you need to leave at five o'clock, although most of us will already be home, so uh, no need to go home, I think. Um, the slides, if you have to leave, uh, the slides uh, will be shared and you will be informed after this meeting, probably tomorrow, um, on uh, where you can download them. Um, and uh, in any case, I would like to invite all of you, uh, whether you can stay or not, to uh, join us on the Open Campus Forum for Q&A, which will be open 24-7, uh, and I would especially like to uh, invite our speakers to uh, uh, join the forum and uh, answer any questions that people may have. So without further ado, um, yes, good point. I just see that uh, the remark that we are recording this session as well. So if you do have to uh, to leave, then uh, you can watch the remainder of the of the event and the presentations uh, later. And again, we will, we will share the link with you uh, on a later stage. So without further ado, I will now pass it on to uh, our fourth speaker, Iris van Duren, who is an assistant professor at IPC, the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And uh, she's also an education coordinator of the World Wildlife, uh, Wildlife Fund regional team in Twente and Vechtal. And she will present about uh, some of the opportunities of earth observation for biodiversity. So Iris, the floor is yours. Good. So, well, uh, let me introduce myself uh, uh, visually. This is uh, uh, me teaching at ITC. This is me in the field, and this is me as a volunteer for WWF in a high school. Um, my passion is uh, uh, yeah, biodiversity conservation, and it is very nice link teaching in natural resource management and uh, linking up with uh, uh, the uh, drives of WWF. A um, couple of years ago, WWF the Netherlands had a strong campaign uh, for uh, sustainable uh, palm oil production. Let me hide this funny uh, announcement. So a couple of years ago, they uh, had a strong campaign for sustainable uh, palm oil production. Uh, if you focus here on Indonesia, the island of Sumatra, and if you would zoom in here, then you could walk 25 kilometers and seeing just one single species, the oil palm, uh, which has taken the place of uh, the habitat of many interesting species like the orangutan or the, the Indonesian elephant. Um, many of the high conservation value forests in Indonesia are replaced by uh, oil palm plantations. And I had luckily uh, a student, Liliana Medora, you see her here, who uh, yeah, try to look at uh, land conversions, how much and where land conversions took place, where oil palm plantations replaced uh, high conservation value forests. So she used uh, multi-temporal images, so uh, frequent images were taken and she uh, analyzed them, looked where forest disappeared and overlaid that later on with uh, oil palm uh, concession maps to see where oil palm really replaced it. So this is one example of uh, the research done in the past. Uh, building further on this, I have right now a student who just started research on something 
similar. Um, in the international or in the in the forest law of Indonesia, uh, it says that uh, water resources have to be protected, peat areas have to be protected. Uh, obliged is to uh, keep a buffer zone of 100 meters uh, around uh, big rivers, 50 meters around small rivers. However, if you would zoom in in Google Earth, uh, same picture here, if you zoom in, you see that the oil palm plantations are really on the river shore. So this is simply illegal against the law, but uh, it's not enforced by the Indonesian government. And my drive uh, is to uh, provide the NGOs and, and the governments who deal with this with uh, objective information and, and transparent information, develop um, algorithms that can spot conversions of riparian areas, peatland areas into oil palm, uh, replacing vulnerable uh, habitats uh, which should be protected and yeah, in that way, I hope to contribute with my research to uh, yeah, global problems like biodiversity uh, uh, yeah, decrees. Um, another example is something completely different. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a, a student from Rwanda who shared the same passion as I have. I'm also a great fan of primate research. And um, Dominique Mvunabandi, he looked at a hypothetical uh, ecological corridor to connect uh, an isolated forest patch in the southwest of Rwanda with uh, a big national park called Nyungwe National Park. And, um, well, he used several satellite-based um, products like uh, a protected area map, a slope map, a distance to road map, a distance to river map, a distance to village map, uh, a forest patch map, and he combined that uh, with different weights to simulate the habitat of chimpanzees and to see how uh, a corridor potentially could be uh, positioned to reconnect uh, the isolated patch and to be um, yeah, to enable the chimps in that isolated forest patch to reunite with their uh, families in, in the national park to avoid inbreeding in the end. So this is another example of uh, yeah, uh, satellites to be used for biodiversity uh, protection. Uh, another uh, example, uh, a bit more recent, uh, just last year we published a paper together with another uh, student of mine, Providence Akayesu, also from Rwanda, and she looked at uh, the food species of this big guy, the mountain gorilla. So you have here the uh, area uh, where those mountain gorillas are found in uh, Rwanda. This is the Virunga uh, National Park. Uh, it shares borders with Uganda and uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, Providence used uh, satellite imagery and vegetation data to update uh, the vegetation map of the area. Uh, the vegetation uh, map was input together with all sorts of other uh, spatial information to model the five most important food species from, uh, for the mountain gorilla. So here's, for instance, rubus, it's a, it's a fruit species. Uh, gallium is another species. So she used species distribution modeling with lots of satellite uh, derived products as input uh, yeah, to model the food distribution so that we better understand the distribution of gorilla and perhaps also uh, predict what will happen if, the, if those fruit species are, uh, yeah, uh, let's say moving or, or uh, disappearing due to climate change or due to human uh, activity. So there's completely other uh, type of uh, uh, use for satellite imagery. Um, then I went last year to Rwanda uh, for my sabbatical. Uh, I stayed for a couple of weeks in the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund uh, at the Kari Soka Research Center and I dedicated some of my free time to uh, design a short course for them to download satellite imagery, to show what you can do with it, how to yeah, uh, make some basic uh, uh, processing steps with free software, with free data. Um, yeah, and this, uh, this was well received by uh, the people in Rwanda. It was an excellent uh, 
or a very nice uh, nice workshop with uh, uh, over 20 people and uh, yeah I with this I uh, I think I close uh, because I think I run out of time uh, but with this I would like to give you a bit of a flavor how I use uh, remote sensing and GIS uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, biodiversity protection Okay, thank you very much, uh, Erich. And uh, this was a, these were very interesting examples of what we can do. Um, I also very much like the uh, example of doing training because that's very much what Brownstation.space uh, will facilitate uh, through its partners, through people like yourself. I would like to facilitate that to uh, to others as well. So without further yeah, ado, feel free to contact us. Uh, we're always willing uh, to help out in capacity building, tailor-made training, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Iris, and uh, we, we may actually take you up on that. Um, I would like to move on to our last speaker. I heard uh, she's running out of time a little bit, so uh, sorry for that, Marjan. Uh, but uh, Marjan van Meerlo is a policy officer on Earth Observation at the European Commission, uh, working on Earth Observation and innovation to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. And she's an expert on the latest European Commission funding calls, and that might be very interesting for our audience. So uh, please, Marjan, the uh, floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can get it up like this. Uh, can you see my screen? Because I cannot see my own screen. Yeah? Yes, yes. That's a feature of, uh, of Google Meet. Oh, so yeah, great. <laughs> okay. Um, let's hope then that, that if I click on the next one that you will actually see the next one as well. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so I'm going to quickly take you into the Horizon 2020 European Green Deal call. Um, I will start with first. Do you see now the next slide? Just to be sure that I'm at the same page. I as do. You? Yeah, yeah. No, Great. I do. You can actually set it to uh, presentation mode if you want to make it a little bit bigger. Uh, so yeah, like that. Yeah. So that still works. Great. Perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, the commission, um, as you are probably all aware of, uh, there was a new commission starting in 2019. Um, and one of the big priorities is actually the European Green Deal. Next to some other priorities, um, you can see them listed here. And in fact, a lot of these priorities actually works together, work together. Um, but since I'm working at the Euro Commi European Commission at the department, the DG of Research and Innovation, and particularly at the unit, sorry, directorate, which is called Healthy Planet, for us, of course, this European Green Deal is extremely important and is one of the focal points of our work. Um, but again, these priorities cannot be seen uh, separate from each other because, in, in fact, they're interacting. Um, so the European Green Deal, what, what it is about, it is about the climate change and environmental degradation um, that are an existential threat to the Europe and the world. Well, I don't need to tell you this. You know, we've seen all the, the last presentations and um, uh, the title of this, this, top, this uh, workshop is not there for, uh, you know, it's, it's not falling out of the sky, so to say. Um, but to overcome these challenges as Europe as a whole, we need a new growth strategy uh, that will transform the unit. Uh, the union into a modern and resource efficient, efficient and competitiveness economy. And you see the three bullet points there um, that is affecting uh, what we want to do with greenhouse gases, how we want to look at economic growth, decoupling it from resource use and uh, making sure uh, that we are inclusive with no person and no place left behind, um, really tackling this as, as a union in uh, 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 complete. The European Green Deal is then the plan for the Commission to make the EU's economy sustainable. Um, and it, we look then, of course, at climate and environmental challenges. Um, and as said before, making sure it's inclusive, but it's really a whole a lot of aspects there within the uh, climate and environmental challenges. And then here you can see it uh, depicting, there's eight specific areas. You can see all of them here. Um, and they're tackling really all of the specific domains within the European Union, um, which we feel are contributing to this. So it's not only ecosystem and biodiversity, which we are here for now, but also looking at an environmental friendly food system, making sure that mobility um, uh, becomes more sustainable. Um, but also, for instance, looking at the, clear, uh, the clean and circular economy. Um, in all of this, the, you have the eight different domains, and then you also have the financing this transition, but to leave no, no one behind as well. So then um, as sort of, let's say, a, a last uh, grand action within Horizon 2020, because if you, uh, you're 
probably all aware as well that we will change the horizon Europe with the start of 2021. Um, but as a last uh, uh, sort of big goal in Horizon 2020, the European Research and Innovation Program, um, we have reserved 1 million or we have invested 1 million to boost green and digital transition and to as such hit the ground running with this European Green Deal. Um, so in 2020 still, uh, we have launched it last September, um, we have this big Green Deal goal. It's uh, pressing the need to confront the climate crisis, provide greater protection uh, for both environment and biodiversity, but also aiding to Europe's recovery in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis and contributing as such directly to the EU's recovery plan for Europe. Um, the closing date is very soon. It's already the 26th of January, and we know that the call is already, by preliminary figures, uh, highly um, um, popular, so to say. Uh, a lot of people have expressed their interest to participate already. Um, so what are we looking for with this Green Deal call? It's not like any other calls we had. It's it's uh, a lot of money in only a couple of topics. Um, it's only 20 topics distributed in 10 thematic area, areas, keeping close to the whole um, overall picture of the Green Deal, uh, with the first eight areas to correspond, uh, correspond correspond exactly to the eight work streams. And then there's two horizontal areas. Um, it's looking for results in the short, short, but also medium term, but with a perspective of the long-term change. So really uh, trying to aid this green deal on the long term. Um, and in this case, uh, yeah, you should really see it as, as a different sort of goal than the ones we have normally speaking under either Horizon 2020 or Horizon Europe. Um, so it's, Eight thematic areas, those areas are the same as you saw in the picture before, where we're looking at the eight different domains which are directly targeting the European Green Deal or the objectives of the Green Deal. But then next to that, we have two horizontal areas. They are looking more at a longer term perspective and they are looking at strengthening the knowledge, but also empowering citizens and empowering consumers. Uh, so they're in that sense, slightly different um, and more targeting um, the, the community as you want than specific domains. And then what are they? Well, you see them here. Um, these are the on the on the uh, left hand side. You see the areas, the thematic down here, um, and then uh, in the middle the, the horizontal ones. And then on the other hand, you see all the different topics. Um, I know that for this community, probably topic 7.1 is the most interesting. Um, my colleague is dealing with that, and he has. Uh, sent me the presentation he's done for the research and innovation days and I forwarded that to the organizations uh, to the organizers of this webinar um, so I think they will also give you access to that one um, in case you're wanting to see what topic 7.1 is about I've also copied here the link to the web page where the for, to the funding portal where you can find every information uh, possible on this um, but uh, what we say basically always when we're talking about the green deal goal please don't just look at one area because the areas there are really trying to be uh, also a bit overarching and a bit more cross-sectoral than uh, we normally do with the calls. So that might, up, um, that might end up with you being, in the end, much more interesting in a topic, interested in a topic in uh, area nine uh, than in area seven, maybe. Um, so I invite you to pre please look at the whole Green Deal call, uh, should you be interested in participating. And then uh, just if you have specific question, I immediately want to point you here to the re research inquiry service, uh, making sure that whatever question you have will be answered by the person who's uh, mainly involved in drafting uh, the particular topics. And that's it from my side, thank you. Okay, excellent Mayan. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, for that very good introduction into the European Green Deal and the opportunities. Um, as you correctly said, we will share all this information with you. I realize that there's lots of internet links that uh, we have uh, passed that are all very lengthy, so uh, impossible to copy. So we will share all that with you. So uh, again, thank you very much, Marjan, and I hope you will be available also in our forum to answer uh, hopefully many questions that people may have to take uh, advantage of all this. Um, so, now I'd like to move on to uh, our almost last section of this uh, of this webinar, and that is the one minute pitches. And we have uh, today, uh, just to get practiced with this, we have one one minute pitch uh, by uh, Linda van Duivenbode. Linda, can you turn on your camera and your microphone? 
There you are. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I understand you had one or two slides that you want to share, and I'm going to time you uh, as soon as the vision point is on. <laughs> no slides, because that saves time. Uh, but okay. thank you for, uh, for allowing me the time. Uh, one of the issues, yeah, I'll start straight away. One of the issues we uh, know in innovation is that for new, new solutions to move from a project stage where you prototype, demonstrate, uh, as uh, Cecile was, uh, for example, saying as a startup, to move to operational implementation uh, in public authorities, which is a big sector that is uh, aimed for by earth observation companies, is public procurement. And so in the Netherlands, we are investigating starting up a buyer's group uh, to involve public authorities that are interested in uh, procuring services, but don't know exactly what or how or from where to buy. Um, bring them together in a learning network. Uh, we do this with uh, uh, the Center of Expertise called Piano here in the Netherlands. Uh, we do it with the standardization agency called NEN. We uh, are interested to hear from you if you are in, if you would be interested in such a buyers group, such a learning network at European level, also involving, for example, the procure to innovate uh, centers of expertise. And that's my pitch. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, again, we will share with you uh, Linda's contact information so you can get in touch with her if you're interested in joining this buyout group. So uh, thank you very much, Linda, for uh, that one minute pitch. And it's really not easy to stay within a minute, is it? And I, I, also, really posted, it. I also posted this on the forum so people <laughs> can go there as well. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we will go to the questions to the speakers. We have a few questions in the Q&A. We will go there very last. So first of all, let me uh, share a little bit more information with you before we go to the Q&A. Um, and first of all, um, it's this one. Um, as I said before, this is a monthly call where we talk about different elements of uh, climate in relation to space, space for climate and opportunities for space in climate challenges. So uh, the next event that we're organizing is on the 6th of January, which believe it or not, is exactly a month from now. We'll be in the new year with lots of new opportunities and uh, uh, lots of healthy people, hopefully, again at four o'clock in the afternoon, and we, you will be informed of that uh, by email. Uh, also on the topic that we'll choose for that, because climate is a very big topic, just like we just saw in the presentations that the, the Green Deal is a big topic that consists of many subtopics, so we'll, uh, uh, together with URC, we'll pick one out again. So mark your calendar for the 6th of January. Then, if this thing does what I wanted to do, Yes, uh, I would like to invite you uh, to the Open Campus Forum. We will go to questions, but uh, I would like to point this out to you before we go to the questions. Uh, you can find the Open Campus Forum uh, on our website, grindstation.space, very simple. And on the main menu, there's a button to uh, the Open Campus. So I would like to uh, ask you to go there and there you will find the forum and we've all work with forums hopefully um, over the last year. So it's it's a forum like many others where you register under number three. If you're already registered, uh, you log in under number four and then you can uh, uh, join the conversation. You can read the conversation without logging in. So if you rather have a look first before, uh, before you jump into the conversation, uh, that's perfectly fine, but uh, really simple. Grandstation.space, open campus, and then uh, it's, self-explanatory. So um, having said that, I would like to move to a few questions and I hope all our um, speakers are still there. Um, so first of all, a question to Jana, actually two questions to Jana and uh, Jana, you may have seen them in the, in the Q&A, but uh, the first yes. question is about uh, the cost. And I think you mentioned something about it, the cost of uh, mm -hmm. UAV and drones versus VHR satellite imagery. Can you say something about that, please? Yeah, it's a bit difficult to say. I, I know I, I said it's it's cheaper to use the drones than the very high resolution satellites. It might not be true if you calculate this, the price per meter square. It depends on what la how large area you are actually want, want to search to search. And of course, the the price of a high very high resolution satellites usually when they are commercial, they are on demand. So you can either look, search for archives to get the cheaper data, or you can order your own data that are much more expensive. So it really depends. But uh, of course, uh, 
and for the drone it's it's quite large investment at the beginning to get the sensor to get the platform and to get somebody trained but then once you have uh, the equipment you can uh, you can monitor for quite a, or acquire the imagery for quite a, a low price so it really depends on how often you actually want to use the drones or you can also order it by the by the commercial by the company to to acquire the imagery and how large area you actually want to want to sur survey so in some cases a uh, very high resolution satellite may be cheaper than the drone i have to admit depends on the purpose <laughs> And if I can go directly to the second question. Yeah, I was just gonna gonna suggest that. Yes, uh, yes please. Yeah. Um, uh, the first part is I considered uh, using uh, polar polarization signal. I didn't really consider that. I cannot really say much about it. I'm sorry. Uh, for the second question, yes, we use the for the for the um, algorithms that we use for interpretation of imagery. Uh, we are using uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, but also classical methods like uh, maximum likelihood, and to compare the the performance of the of the uh, algorithms. And in in sometimes surprisingly, the classical methods can be more effective than machine learning. It really depends on the plant, and uh, we are quite a lot using object based image analysis, but uh, depends also on the plant if it's really uh, makes really specific objects that are difficult, that, that are easy to, to recognize, then the object-based image analysis is much more powerful. But in the cases, it doesn't make really distinct objects like, for example, uh, Rainutria or the, the knotweed, then uh, spectrum uh, methods comes in place, like pixel-based methods. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much for that explanation, uh, Jana. And, and again, if you have more questions for Jana or for any of the other speakers, please ask them also in the forum. Um, Iris, I don't know if you've seen, but there's a question for you from Linda um, about your colleague in Rwanda. Did he, did he succeed in actually creating that corridor? No, no, no. That uh, is a hypothetical uh, issue because uh, the surrounding area around Siamodongo that heavily... Uh, planted with tea plantations, uh, eucalypta for, uh, eucalyptus forest. So in reality, you should be acquiring land for landscape restoration. So it's, uh, it's, it's not yet possible. Uh, there's people living, making a living uh, in the area surrounding it. So it was purely a hypothetical uh, exercise. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's very unfortunate to hear. Actually, that's a, yeah. it's a good comparison to, uh, I know the Netherlands is very good in creating corridors for wildlife between the very small pockets of nature that exist in the Netherlands uh, through all these, uh, all these wide viaduct, uh, wild viaducts over, over motorways. Yeah, I, what, I, what, was, what was actually a very good exercise is we talked also to uh, uh, the Jane Goodall uh, Institute and uh, researchers from uh, uh, that institute to help us to uh, give values to the different uh, variables, like how, how important are forest patches compared to distance to rivers, uh, how important are slopes uh, compared to uh, uh, distance uh, to roads. So to create those models, this, this idea was, was very good. Uh, the final products that we showed can still be improved. But yeah, indeed, it's it's uh, yeah. We need to find ways to invest to uh, convert perhaps tea plantations or other land uses back again to forest patches to make stepping stones for those chimps to be able to uh, move from one place to the other. So there's still lots of things that need to be done to make it possible. Yeah, yeah, because I guess this is a worldwide uh, issue. Uh, as I said, yeah. the Netherlands has this issue. I live in the UK where these corridors also do not exist and therefore we see a lot of roadkill here for example so uh, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah um i would like to go to the last question by Miona uh, gligoric who is asking re really in general um to anyone and and actually i i know a few contexts myself but does anyone here have experience in insect and pest monitoring uh, I've been working with the bark beetle outbreaks uh, yeah, for the uh, spruce um, those trees. So this is only one experience with the pest monitoring. And for the bark beetle, there is quite a lot, a lot of work done because it's a big issue, especially in last years with the, all the, the drought 
in Europe and in our country. We uh, had recently a PhD student who uh, graduated on that using optical imagery. Uh, last year, I had one student using um, Sentinel-1 radar imagery uh, for monitoring. And I had also a student making a, a, yeah, a distribution model based on different uh, GIS mm -hmm. layers. So we do research on that in ITC. Okay, very good. So both Jana and Iris have experience. I happen to know a company at the Netherlands, um, ESA Business Incubation Center, that worked on also on the bark beetle recognition from space. So, uh, so there's quite a few things. So, Miona, if you'd like to, to know more, I can get you in touch with uh, Jana, Iris, and perhaps a few other people um, if you want. And again, uh, I would like to invite you to, uh, to the forum. Um, there's one more question, very specific question by Avery. I don't know if you can see that, Jana, that might be aimed at you. Um, he has a, Avery has a question or actually a recommendation to investigate together with uh, remote sensing specialists the differentiating signature of polarization from different plants. This, this, this goes a bit far, but can you say one or two sentences about this before we move it to the forum? I, uh, I already we don't have experience with, uh, I cannot really comment on this part, so I can, I can take it as a recommendation for the, for the future work. Thanks for that idea. <laughs> That's it. Thanks. So let's take that as a recommendation then. And again, uh, with this, this is a good bridge to, uh, and, and thank you, Jana, for, for, for answering it. A good bridge to uh, invite all of you once again to the forum. Uh, I kept the slide uh, visible so you can see how this works um, and invite you to the next uh, session in January. And uh, just say thank you to our uh, speakers. Thank you to my co-organizers. And of course, thank you to everybody uh, who were patient enough to, uh, to hang on for a little bit longer than, uh, than, in, than initiated. But I really hope that we've been able to uh, give you uh, a lot of useful information this time. And again, I'm looking forward to seeing you on the forum. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next month. Cornel, you have uh, a last thing to say? Thank you, uh, Ranko. I just want to thank all the speakers and everyone who supported uh, this initiative on uh, such a short notice. And I hope that we can grow this, uh, this uh, unique initiative. And uh, I hope to see you all on the networking platform and of course on our next uh, webinar uh, next month. So with that, I can. I think we can close uh, this uh, webinar. Okay. Thank you all. Bye bye.